Well, as we looked at chapter four, we saw some amazing things. We saw there was a, a vision in heaven. There was a door opened up. And all of a sudden, instead of looking down here at the churches, we're, look, we're going up and looking up, and we hear a voice, and he says, come up here. And so immediately John found himself in the spirit, up in heaven, and he's going to learn some absolutely wonderful things while he's there. The first thing he saw, he said he saw a throne in heaven and one sitting upon the throne. Oh, all the things that are going on in this earth for the last 6,000 years have been awful. And it looks like nobody's ruling over it as men have tried to rule over it. But there is a throne in heaven and he's never advocated that throne. It is his and his alone. And there's one who sits upon that throne, and he is a sovereign. In fact, it says he is like stone. He, is, he doesn't change. We change. We change all the time. I find myself mostly changing for the worse. But he doesn't change at all. And around the throne, he says, there's like a rainbow around it. The promises of God are, are ever new. And he's going to do his will. And there around the throne, there were 24 elders. And we said those are probably representative of the church that is taken out. And now these 24 are representing the church as they're around the throne. And as they're around the throne, all of a sudden there's, there's lightnings and thunders. There's all these sounds and voices going on. There's going to be judgment coming in this book. This book is not a... And a lot of it's not a happy book. A lot of it is a very fearful thing to read what's going to come upon the face of this earth and the people of it. So, but don't fear. He said there's the seven lamps. There's the seven spirits. He knows everything. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going to happen. And then we saw that there was at this throne, there was a sea of crystal. And we said, boy, isn't that great? All the turmoil of this earth, all the wars, all the sorrow, but before the throne of God, he is not ruffled by any of it. It's always the same. He changes not, and his throne rules and reigns, and all the sin and the affairs of man have not touched the throne in heaven. And then we saw that there were some creatures there. No, amazing things, right? One like a lion, one like a calf, one like a man, and one like an eagle covered in eyes. That's kind of a freaky thing, right? Covered in eyes. He sees everything. He knows everything. Whatever aspect of creation, man, woman, heaven, heavenly, earthly, it doesn't matter. He sees it all, and he knows it all. And so we find that when they look upon him, these creatures cry out, holy, holy, holy. And we sang that this morning too, didn't we? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. So here's the one who sits upon the throne. And as it all starts out, here he is, glorious in majesty, glorious in beauty, set and the, the creatures cry out that he is the one who is holy different perfect all right and then the four and twenty elders take their crowns and throw it before the altars you know why do we win crowns why do we want to win rewards in heaven so we have something to give to the lord jesus right the kids little kids come and they want they want to they want to give mommy a present for christmas well you got your choice you can give them some money and they can go up buy some or you can have them Make something, right? What does mommy like most? The make stuff rather than something just given to them. Well, the Lord is the same way. It's, this, this motherhood is part of the, part of the divine nature. They, he likes things that we have made. That's what he says in Psalm mm, 45. I will, make, I will give things of the Lord that I have made, that I have done. Well, they throw the thrones before him, and they give praise, and they give a creature praise. Now, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, and you, for you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. 
So what we've done in chapter four, we finished chapter four. We're getting ready for chapter five, and it is the great. No, where's Jeff? Jeff left. Okay. So some of you are looking at it and going, what's that? What is that? Well, when, when Jeff's in the, in, the, in the symphony there, and he's got his string bass, and he's, he's doing all this technical stuff, and he's got a loose wrist, and he's got a loose arm, and he's playing all this beautiful stuff. Okay. And then he sees this sign in his music. And when he sees this sign in his music, he tightens up the wrist, and he tightens up his arm, because he's going to dig into that bass. He's going to make it loud. And the, the horn players who are going, doo, 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 they're taking a bigger breath. The violin players, they're talking to them and they're getting ready to go down on those strings. This is called the crescendo. The crescendo. Things are building up to a pitch, to a fever, to something fabulous and wonderful. The crescendo. And that's what we have in chapter five. A crescendo. It's not just a crescendo of chapters four and five. It is a crescendo of the whole Bible. It is a most amazing as we look at this thing. We have this scene set up, and now we're going to look at God's crescendo. Let's read together. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or even look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand, of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll, and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Wow, that's a crescendo. Jeff, you missed out on my, I used you for an for a object lesson. Had that bass going, get ready for the crescendo. Yeah, you know, putting it all in there. Oh, man. If you've ever seen him play, you see him do that sometimes. When they hit that crescendo, you'll see a different look on his face when he it, it, it takes some power. This is what happened. All creation is getting and bringing this crescendo. What a, what a deal. Well, let's look at it a little more closely. The writing. We have a scroll in the right hand of him who sits on the throne. We know a lot of things about our God, fortunately. We know he's omnipotent, omnipresent. 
we know we know he's 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 he can do anything he's um he's um omnipotent we know a lot of things about him but one of the cool things we know about him is god is a writer he likes to write and by the way he expects us to read he doesn't just write for his own enjoyment though maybe he does that some too but he is a writer we find him writing the whole history of mankind. We find him writing what every person has done on the planet in all time. Now we find at the end of this book that people at the great white throne judgment are judged by the things written in the book. He writes things down. And so here we have a scroll in his hand with seven seals. Well, there's a lot of talk about what's this book for? What is it about? Well, I would present to you that this book is the finished future of the world and of the universe. The emphasis on finished. It's already done. He knows all things from the end, from the beginning to the end. So he holds out, there's this book, and there are things to be done. And as we open up this book, we're going to see some of the things that are being done. But here's this scroll, and the work of God, the plans of God are finished. It's sealed up. Nobody gets to write anything else in it. Men have been trying to write history now for the last 6,000 years, haven't they? They've been trying to set up their kingdoms. They've been trying to rule over people. They've been trying to make their governments. They've been trying to make their philosophies. And oh, all the things, we will write history. We will change the future. We will do it all. They didn't do a thing. It's written. It's sealed. Now, here's the thing. They did do things, and they are responsible. Sovereignty and responsibility both come in here and kiss in this book. Because you see, we are responsible for what we do. We have choices. We have will. And the things that we do have consequences. And people can kind of try to change the earth, and it appears that they do. You know, you think Mr. Putin is changing things over there in Ukraine? Well, yeah, he is. Does God know it all from the beginning? Well, yeah, he does. And here's the amazing thing that the, the wrath of man working over here, it only goes so far, God restrains it, and he works all things after the counsel of his own will. He can allow both decisions and be sovereign at the same time. He has written the book. He works out all things from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 10. The Lord declaring from the beginning, the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things which are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. The book is sealed. It's written on the front and the back. There isn't any place to, for people to write anything on it. it it's, it's full, and, it, and nobody's going to change it. Hmm. What else do we know about this book? Well, we know from the, from the rest of the book, starting at chapter 6, when the seals are opened up, it's about judgment. It's about judgment, and there's a lot of judgment to come on this world. Personal judgment, government judgment, national judgment, the satanic judgment, all these judgments are about to take place, and this book is going to open them up. We're going to see what it's going to be like. It's a book of redemption. The world has been usurped by an evil entity called Satan, and men have usurped power and, and have sold themselves to sin, but God's redeeming. God's redeeming it. He's redeeming individuals out now and building his church. But in the end here, he's going to redeem it all. As he calls it in the other place in the New Testament, there's going to be a restitution of all things. Everything's going to be made right. Everything's going to be set the way it's supposed to be. Everybody's going to look back and go, oh, he knew what he was doing. Glory be to his name. 
It's a book of redemption. It's a book that is sealed. Now, we don't seal things too much. We, that's the only thing we seal these days. Court documents are sealed. Court documents are sealed because there's information in there that the jurors need to know, but the rest of the public doesn't need to know. And only the person who is designed in that seal, who knows the information, can open it and look at it. Now, in the old days, they used to have the seal of the king and so forth. And when you would seal the king and put their name on it, then only that person could open that up. Otherwise, off with their head type stuff, right? The seal document means that there's only one person who's supposed to open this. There's a, a romantic version of this concept in the Song of Solomon, where the bride says, set me as a seal upon your heart. Isn't that pretty? What's, he, what's she saying? She says, look, put a seal on your heart that only I can open your heart up. Mary likes that, Jeff. She likes that. You might get a little hug there. Yeah. Set me as a seal upon, nobody else gets to open this. Isn't that cool? That's the concept that's being brought out here. Only there's seven seals, and only one person has the right to open it. Well, who is worthy? A strong, loud, strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. It's, you get the idea that this has gone out through the last 6,000 years, and it's going to go out again. Who is worthy to execute the program of God. Who's worthy to give judgment? Are we worthy? <sighs> we are lousy. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Give space to vengeance because ours is so faulty. You know? And the way men want to build governments, oh, it's so, it's so faulty, especially when it removes itself from the word of God and the revelation of God. It's awful. Who's worthy? Huh? Is, is, is Abraham worthy? Is David worthy? Is Napoleon worthy? Okay. Is Donald Trump worthy? Who's worthy? And so what does he find? A want, a lack. Goes to all, all the heavens and earth and under the earth. And who is worthy? There wasn't anybody even worthy to look at it. Nevertheless, open it. There's nobody even know what, what does the future hold? Well, the, the start market analysis will tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> they don't know what's going to happen, you know? Economists tell you what's going to happen. Now, economists is that one job where you can be always wrong and still keep your job, okay? <laughs> Because people are only listening to what you say today. They don't look back on what you said yesterday. All right? it's, it's a quite a deal. They don't know the future. They can't even look at the future. They don't know what's in it. And so what does John do? He weeps. He weeps. And why does he weep? Look, if there's not judgment on this world, then this is a bad scene because there is judgment deserved. If there's not wrongs made right and the innocent who are slaughtered being made whole and those who have done it taken to judgment, then this is a horrible world that we live in. It is horrible. We don't want to live in a place like this. It is worth weeping about. And so he did weep. Who can execute the righteous counsels of God? Who can do it? Somebody. And nobody was found worthy. So John looked at it and said, this is the end. And the end is awful. This end is awful. But there is relief. There is a champion. Yeah, and, and one of those elders, one of those guys who knew his Bible, studied it down here on earth, knew about the prophecy, knew what was coming, knows what's happened. He says, whoa, John, you don't need to weep. You can stop right now. For the lion of the tribe of Judah, he 
can do it. There is one. And so who does he who does he go to? He goes to the son who is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And we have to look a little back in Genesis to know what in the world he's talking about. Jacob now was getting ready to die at the end of the book of Genesis, and he passes on some wonderful uh, prophecies of the nation of Israel. The great fathers were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So here we're ending the fathers. And at the end of the fathers, he gives a prophecy, and this is one of them, Judah. You are he whom your brethren shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, and your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, that means the rest comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had had their prophecies, and now he says it's going to break up into the 12 tribes, and it's going to go through Judah. What's the word Judah means? It means praise. It means praise. It's going to go through one family. This is like the beginning of the prophecies for the children of Israel. We don't have a prophecy for mankind. The seed of the woman would destroy the serpent, right? Crush the serpent's head. We had a we had a the prophecy in the days of Noah was Shem, that the lineage would come through Shem. But now we have it. We had it come through Abraham, right? Abraham, in his seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And now it's getting narrowed down to the lion of the tribe of Judah. All right? And so what does he also say? Not only is it the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's the root of David. Now, when we think of David, and it's like, you know, David's mentioned as a relation to the, to the Lord Jesus in the Gospels more than almost anybody else. Because he was the son of David. And as, but as, as, as the Lord showed to some of the guys, as the Lord said to my Lord, oh, wait a minute, is David his son or is David his Lord? And they said, well, I don't know. What do you keep asking these questions for? And so the, the situation is, he's the root of David. Why was David great? Well, because the Lord Jesus is great. Because he's the source of all the glories of, of David comes from the Lord Jesus. He uses this phrase again in the last chapter, or next last chapter, the root of David and offspring of David. So he's the one who began it. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. We're going to see this concept a few more times. He has the right to open it up, not just because of who he is, but because of what he's done. What he's done. He prevailed. All men failed except this one man from the tribe of Judah, through the nation of Israel, a one who is an inheritor of the ruler of the throne of David. He has prevailed, and he can loosen the seven seals. He has the right to prevail because of his sufferings. And so he looked. He looked to see this lion, and what does he see? Is he a lion? No, he sees a lamb. In fact, we don't have the lion mentioned again as the Lord Jesus in the rest of the book. But we have the lamb mentioned 25 times at least. How the Lord Jesus presents himself is most wonderful. He's a lamb standing. Even though he has died, he's not laying there dead. He's not laying there like a sacrifice that's had his throat cut. He's standing. He's standing because he's going to get the job done. But it's still based on him being the lamb that was slain. Ever for eternity, the topic of glory is going to be the lamb that was slain. We sang about it this morning, maybe more than once. The lamb that was slain. You know, 
as we as we read the rest of this book and we see all the demonic and the human symbols that are going to be shown you got beasts you got dragons you got locusts you got you got all these horns you got all these crazy things going on fierce animals fierce things the lord jesus is a lamb an innocent one a weak one one who doesn't he's not a carnivore he doesn't eat up other people <laughs> He's, he's, he's one who, who is gentle as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And the, the concept that goes through all eternity is there is one who is worthy, and he did it through love and humility and meekness. And in that form, he prevailed. He is the lamb who was slain but he's a lamb who is strong he's got seven horns and as we find it elsewhere in scriptures those horns represent authorities of power authorities of nations all kinds you're going to find a whole bunch of them going on later on in this but everybody's got horns horns knocked off all this kind of stuff but the lord jesus has seven a number of completion all strength belongs to a lamb a lamb that was slain all wisdom goes to him. He's the lamb all seeing, the seven spirits of God, these seven eyes. Yeah, this is the one who is worthy. This is the one who deserves all the glory and the honor and the praise, the one who can open the book. And so what does he do? He just takes the book. He didn't grovel for it. He didn't say, well, here's my credentials. He didn't say, this is, this is what, I, there's no hesitation. There's no permission. The one who is in the throne has it at his right hand. And who do we know is at the right hand? Right? The Lord Jesus, right? And so he just reaches over and takes it because this is what his father wants him to do. This is why he was ordained from the foundation of the world the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world to take it and open it up and finish this great program of God, which he started eons ago. Mm. We have that lamb and he's ready to do the work that needs to be done. Well, as soon as that happens, as soon as that happens, the crescendo sign, you know, it's seen right there, right? They, they see it and they go, it's here. And these worshipers, they ain't taking the thought. They, they fell down. They fell down before him. This is the beginning. If we could just read the excitement of these words and the way they felt it. Now, I had the, oh, I call it a privilege experience or whatever it is when I was in college of going to an OU football game. Went to a couple of them, all right? And those are a big deal for both sides. It is a real big deal. And so everybody's in those stands. Yes, and, and, and there's a reason they call them stands there because everybody is there and the teams get out. And as they come out on the field, the emotions are getting higher and higher and higher. And your team's out there. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And all of a sudden, they put the football out there, and the guy gets out and kicks it. Then there's not one person sitting in those stands. They are up on their feet. They are incredibly excited. This coming to a crescendo, this game has started we paid a lot of money. We've come a long way. We've got a lot of, of glory on the line here. And it gets exciting, let me tell you. Maybe I should go to one of those again. But it, it, gets, it gets so, and this, but this, this takes it another step. This is heaven. This is heaven. And the kickoff just happened. The lamb took the scroll. Woohoo! Things are going to happen. Things are going to be exciting. Things are going to be revealed. It's coming to an end, people. 
It's going to be played out, and it is amazing. They, as soon as that happens, as soon as it happens, they fall down. Now, each has a, each has a harp. And I'll take a little bit different angle on this, maybe than some. A harp is, we think of music, but a harp was actually the instrument played by the prophets. The prophets would play a harp, and they would sing songs, and they would prophesy things. That's why a lot of our psalms are probably based on, pro on harp tunes, because a lot of them are prophetic. So all the prophecies, all the prophecies that have gone on through the ages. Now they'd studied their book. They knew of the, the coming seed of the woman. They knew of the one who was born in Bethlehem. They knew of this one who was going to pay for sins. They knew this one who was going to rule and reign. They had seen these prophecies for years and years, and they, all, all of it's coming to an end. All of it's coming to this, 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 this great crescendo. And the, the golden bowls and the prayers of the saints, what might that mean? Ever since the beginning of time, there's been a cry out, how long, O oh Lord? When is this how long are you going to let sin rule and reign on the earth? How long are you going to let the innocent be slain and the evil take hold of things? It's, uh, Enoch prophesied it, right? Enoch prophesied it, that the Lord was going to come within thousands of his angels thousands of years ago. The, the psalmists write about it, those precatory psalms, they call them. Some of those are kind of hard to read. Take this line. As a, as a Jewish writer writes, I mean, it's Psalm 139, blessed is he who dashes your children against the rock. Now, we don't pray that today, do we? We don't pray that. But there's coming a time that will actually be prayed. There's coming judgment. When the, the disciples ask the Lord, how should we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, honor him, honor who he is. And what's the next verse? How me that your kingdom come. And we're always supposed to keep the future in our eyes. We're always supposed to see that this world will be taken down and the Lord Jesus will rule and reign and everything will be set right. Whoa. Whoa. They are, those golden bowls are poured out now. Those prayers are going to be answered. They're going to be answered. And it's going to be a, a good answer. So they sang a new song. Now, as you look at the words of this, you think, oh, there's been a lot of songs that those words are kind of like those words in them, you know. And it says, it says it's a new song, a new song. Well, sometimes you hear a song, and you've, you've heard the song several times before. But Jeff will come to you and say, wait a minute, you got to hear this version of this. You've never heard it like this before. Okay, I'll listen to it. And I listen to it, and I go, you're right, I've never heard it before. I've never heard it this good before. How can somebody do that? Well, maybe you've all eaten hamburgers before, right? Everybody eating hamburgers, I'm very quick. But, but Dave Mitch says, hey, I got a hamburger place. He always knows a place and always knows a person. I got a place that has the best hamburgers. You've never tasted a hamburger like this one. And he takes you over there and you eat that hamburger and you realize, I've never eaten a hamburger before. This is, this is the real deal. That's what we have here. We've heard music before. We've heard songs before, but, but not like this one. This is new. This is fresh. This is absolutely mind boggling and incredible. They sing a new song. And what do they sing about? Well, the reputation of the one that he is worthy. The Lord Jesus deserves all the glory, the honor, and the blessing. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. Because why? Again, here's this topic. You were slain. It brings the idea of it was unjust. You slay. It was unjust that the Lord Jesus should be put on that cross. It was the, the, the thought and the desire of men to say, we will not have this man to rule over us. 
we will slay him. We read about it this morning. The chief priests got together and took counsel about how they might kill him. That is ever in heaven. But it's also there in heaven that he was slain for us. That he was our substitution there. And so all of you were slain and you have redeemed. His, his, his work there was not just something that was for himself. Though it was for himself, it did justify God in all of his actions and all of his doings. So now the world can say, oh, that's why it happened. But he did it to redeem men and women. He did it to buy us back from the penalty of our sins. How marvelous. Now that's something to sing about. You know, there's an old uh, uh, gospel quartet song. It's a song holy angels cannot sing. Gordon Jensen, I think. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And so many of our songs are caught up with that, aren't they? Thinking about how he has paid for our part, how he has redeemed, how he has been the sacrifice once and for all. This is the theme that still goes on in heaven after it's done. Oh, the redeemed, and then there is a reign. He has made us kings and priests to our God. He didn't just save us. He gave us a position. He gave us jobs to do. He gave us an elevated situation to, to reign as kings and priests. Maybe the best translation is over the earth, but he gave us jobs, and we will have jobs. We will rule over the earth. Some have a few kingdoms, some have many. This is going to happen. And it's something to sing about. Something to sing about because we don't rule and reign down here. Apostle Paul says to Corinthians, oh, I wish you did rule. It was a kind of tongue-in-cheek sarcasm that we say. I wish you did rule, but you know what? You're going to rule. We're all going to rule one of these days. And what a glorious job that will be. Some of you like your jobs. Some of you don't like your jobs, but there's a job coming that you will like. You will get to rule and reign for the Lord of glory, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Well, the redeemed are singing a song. The angels are looking at that going, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. One of the reasons all this thing happened here on earth with all these men was for us, because we had our ranks. Some of them fell. We estimated about a third of them. A third of them fell, and there's no redemption for them. The Lord didn't take upon himself the seed of angels, we read in Hebrews, but of Abraham. He became a man. But now we see that if there's anything that he could have done to redeem angels, he would have done it. We see through men, a salvation that we've desired to look into. And we have from the very beginning, right? When the Lord Jesus was, was conceived, who was there? Angels. When the Lord Jesus was born, who was there? Angels. When the Lord Jesus was tempted, who was there? Angels. When the Lord Jesus was at his suffering in Gethsemane, who was there? Angels. When the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, who was there? Angels. When the Lord Jesus was received up in the glory, who was there? Angels. Yeah, they're a big deal. They're a big part of the show. And that's why Peter says we have a salvation that angels desire to look into. They learn of God's salvation through what the Lord Jesus did for us. And so they say, wait a minute, we got to join in on it. Now, it doesn't say that they sang. In fact, the Bible doesn't talk about angels singing, except at the very beginning of creation where the morning stars sang, that after the fall, we don't have angels singing, regardless of what your hymns may say. Angels say, and what do they say? Oh, oh what I mean, their number. How many of them were there? Well, they didn't have the same numbering system that we have in the Greeks. So they have 10,000 times and thousands and thousands of thousands. The best that we can come up with that is referring to as billions. Billions. And well, that's an awful lot of angels. Well, you got that many people, okay? We got almost 8 billion now. Probably that many have died in the past. 
How many angels are there? Well, I don't know. There's guardian angels, and if everybody has a guardian angel, it needs to be 8 billion of those. There's probably more than that. This is a loud noise, my friends. We got the church singing, we got the 4B singing, and we got a bazillion angels singing. Crescendo, crescendo. It is loud. It is amazing. And what do they say? Worthy is the Lamb. Again, what do we have? The one who was slain. This is our third time, right? Slain, slain, slain. What do we do when we gather together to remember the Lord Jesus? What is on that table? Okay, the bread, the wine separated. Slain, slain, and it will forever be the object of the glory of heaven. He was slain. He is worthy to receive, and we have a sevenfold blessing here. He's worthy to receive power. What kind of power? Well, men have usurped the power of God now for the last 6,000 years. They've set up their kingdoms. They set up the rules. They set up their IRS. They set up all kinds of things to rule the CDC. They set up all kinds of things to rule and reign over people. Their power. The Lord Jesus is going to get all the power. They've usurped it. They've taken it by craft, thinking that it was theirs to use. Just like we do with our own lives, right? We take our lives and think that it's, our lives are for me. I can do whatever I want. No. Not without consequences, my friend. Your life is for Christ. He will get riches. Oh, the riches of this world and how it has been, oh, grasped for, how it's been stolen, how it's been killed for. People have riches and riches and riches. You know, they, Forbes, the richest people in the world. Yeah, you got your Bezos, you got your uh, Elon Musk. I think he's number one now, though many people say that uh, Vladimir Putin has more. But the rich people of the world who have accumulated hundreds of billions of dollars of their money. It's not going to be their money. We accumulate money, okay? Let's think about this. You got money in the bank? John's keeping your money in the bank there, okay? Does he actually keep money in the bank? Not very much. Not very much. It's all in computers. It's all digital. It's all in accounting somewhere. What happens if that accounting gets obliterated? What do you got? Not too much. That's what happened in Ukraine. That's where the Russians attacked first. The banks, the businesses obliterated what people had. Riches, woo, they can make themselves wings, can't they? But the Lord Jesus is going to have it all. Wisdom, the wisdom of this world saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're so smart. We have figured out this and we have figured out that. Man, we can send a set. We can send a telescope a hundred million miles out into space. And, and, and well, that's pretty amazing. You know, I, I saw the guys who develop it and they told why they wanted to do it. They said they wanted to see the beginning of time. They wanted to see how it all started. Morons! <laughs> Read your Bible if you want to know how it started. There's the wisdom of God. Everybody will know that wisdom. Strength. The, the right to rule. Who's going to have it? The Lord Jesus is going to have it. Honor. Honor now gets put in people who don't deserve one bit of honor. But the Lord Jesus deserves it and will get it. Glory. Oh, the glory, the revelation of the perfections of a person. We have a cancel culture. Or we think a person has some glory, boy, they work hard to, to, to get rid of it, to cancel them out. But it's not hard to do. This is the thing. It's not hard to cancel out anybody because we're all a bunch of jerks. But the Lord Jesus, you can't cancel him out without lies. He deserves all honor. He deserves all glory. 
and it deserves all blessing. All praise should go to him. And the sum of it all, no, oh, the sum of it all. Hmm. Blessing to him who sits on the, upon the throne. Oh, well, it's not part of my verse there. And to the Lamb, and to the Lamb. All glory is going to be given to this one. All glory is going to be getting given to that ruler who is sitting there and to the Lamb who is accomplishing it all. This kind of reminds us again of, of Philippians, isn't it? Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea, all of them say, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him that sits upon the throne. It's kind of a scene, I think, that maybe, maybe it's not just them, but, it, then it, but it's a scene of the whole entity of time and space and programs and purposes of God. It has started. It has started and it's going to be amazing. And we know it's going to be amazing. so amazing, it's like it's already over. It's already happened. Because that, oh, that book was sealed. It was written on the back and front, and nobody's changing what's going to go on there. And the Lord Jesus will rule and reign forever. Well, let's think about what can we take home today. There is an end to the church age. It's not going to go on down here forever. It will go on in heaven forever. There is a throne that rules all. Don't give up on that. No matter how bad the earth looks, no matter how bad the, the news is, on, and no matter, there is a throne that rules and there is a sovereign on that throne. You can't stop him. There is an unchangeable future. That's good to know. Good to know that men can't control it. Men, men no matter how hard they try. I mean, we have enough nuclear Arsenal to, to wipe out the earth, what, 20, 100 times over, whatever it is, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The Lord is the one that's going to judge the earth. There is a single individual worthy to execute the plan and only one. And that one is a lamb that was slain because he is worthy. There will be an innumerable host of men and angels in heaven. Innumerable host. The question goes around, will there be more people in heaven or more people in hell? Yeah. You know, we can bat it around. But I think I'm going to have to agree with Robertson that heaven wins. Because so many have died in youth. So many have died in other circumstances. That he will take them to be there. What was it? Up to 1850, the average lifespan of a human being was 14 years. It's because so many died before the one year, okay? They died before one year, and it kind of moves that figure over there. All praise will be for the one who has done it.